promise you that we've been looking forward to this. This is really exciting. I see that we have 31 people on here that want to talk Red Sox baseball. So, Beth, thank you for the opportunity. And then thanks to the 30 other people that are here to, uh, to join in. I want to echo what Beth said earlier. Uh, we want this to be relaxed, have fun. Uh, we get more fun hearing your story. So even though you're on mute, please feel free to join in and uh, pick up on any train of thought we're talking about as far as the Red Sox go. Uh, I want to thank Bill. I know he's busy with all his writing. Ed, who's on the phone, I know is an umpire. And I want to tell Ed that I am currently reading uh, Bill's book, uh, Working a Perfect Game, which is about umpires, and I'm thoroughly enjoying it. So, Ed, if you hadn't checked that out, please, please do so. Uh, as Beth said, Mike and I have been doing this for almost six years now. Uh, we've had a constant stream of Red Sox fans in our program here in Central Texas, so we're, we're accustomed to talking Red Sox. I want to quickly acknowledge though, Michael White from Scotland because the reason we even have a talking baseball program in Central Texas is because Michael started a football memories program in Scotland back in 2004 that is now in several other countries. I think they're running it in 250 communities just in Scotland. Uh, Michael and I are also working on a similar program to Talking Baseball called Jukebox Days that we've run for several of Beth's uh, cafes so far, and we've had a great response. So uh, thanks to Michael for joining in. And, and I guess with that, I'm going to share my screen, and it'll take me just a second to bring everything up. Michael, do you want to give us a wave or did you want to say anything? Yeah. Else? No, I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine. We're happy, happy you're here. Yeah. yeah, looking forward to this. Okay, can everybody see the Fenway Park? Yes, we can yep. see it. Yep. Thank Looks you. Looks good. Okay, so my first question is when I saw this slide, is this a Photoshop picture or has anybody ever seen Fenway Park with such a beautiful sunset? Well, I hope that doesn't mean it's Photoshop, but. Uh, well, Jim, uh, yeah. I wanna say Polly and I, I can't quite tell all the names, raised their hand and said yes, so. Oh, great. And there might've been others as well. Okay, because I think it's just a beautiful picture and it, it does bring back memories of the many times that uh, I've been to Fenway. Uh, in terms of the agenda, here's what we have. Um, we're gonna go through this and quite honestly, if we don't get through, I think that's a great thing because that means you all had uh, lots of comments and lots of stories and maybe we can come back later and finish the rest of the agenda, but we're gonna talk about favorite Red Sox outfielders. And I don't mean best, I mean, who was your favorite? So there are no right or wrong answers, let us know. Same thing about catchers. And then with all of our talking baseball programs, we try to break it up a little bit because not everybody is willing to sit and talk baseball for a full hour. So I love to talk about old TV. So we're going to talk about a couple of TV shows from the 50s and 60s, and I'm going to cheat a little bit because the clips I'm going to show have a baseball flavor to them. Uh, what I think is going to be the most fun part of the agenda is we're going to talk about your favorite Fenway experiences. Uh, and then we'll, we'll talk about pictures and then throw in a little old music. And of course, that'll be built around Sweet Caroline. So with that, let's, let's just go to the first one. And we wanna talk about favorite Red Sox outfielders. And I'm showing outfielders from the 50s, 60s and 70s. And if you have a favorite from that era, please let us know. If you have a favorite from recent, the current team, please let us know. So does anybody want to share with us 
your favorite Red Sox outfielder? So you can either feel free to unmute yourself and just go ahead and talk, or if you want to put it in the chat box, you can do that too. Either way. Do we not have any favorites or are they coming in on the chat box? Let's just give it one minute here. Okay. I think we're getting a vote for Ted Williams. Oh, Fred Lynn. Fred Lynn, right. Fred Lynn, yep. This is Bill. I'll, I'll speak up with a vote for Ted Williams. I grew up in the mostly in the 1950s and he was my hero growing up, which is one of the reasons I've I've done some research and writing about him. That's great. I'm going to throw in Dom DiMaggio. Ah, Dom DiMaggio. Good okay. one. And I just heard a call for Tony C. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Tony. also Manny. <laughs> Manny. Manny being Manny. Yeah. I think Manny is still, or at least was still, trying to play in a Japanese league this season. He actually went to Australia. Australia, that's what it was. Uh, but he didn't, for some reason, he didn't, uh, he didn't join the team at the last minute. Right, but but that's but he's still trying to play. Yeah. 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 No, that's pretty good. And here's one for Yaz for Yastrzemski. <laughs> yes. In one of our programs in Central Texas, uh, we have a gentleman that grew up in Waterbury, Connecticut, and at every meeting, he tells us about playing ball as a kid with Jimmy Pearsall, who was a noted Red Sox uh, outfielder and I think ended up as a announcer for the White Sox for a while. Yeah, he, he did some radio. He's the first baseball player I ever met. I grew up in Jamaica Plain and then Lexington yeah. and he came out and did a, uh, he was a personality that showed up at the local shoe store in Lexington when I was maybe 11 years old or something. Yeah, fun. So I wonder, with all these favorites, uh, has anybody met any of these old Red Sox? Well, and Jim, uh, yeah. I see Polly Slavitt, and I apologize if I pronounced the name wrong, said uh, Ben Intendi. Ah, uh, uh, don't get me started on the, the <laughs> exit actually, of all the Red Sox outfielders. I'm <laughs> that's, that's the jersey I'm wearing today is uh, Ben Intendi's jersey. And what, we lost Jackie Bradley Jr. yesterday? Yeah. Any other favorites? Well, maybe, maybe um, one of you will remember who this might have been. Uh, I remember the circumstances, but not, not the outfielder. This is back uh, probably in the early 1980s. Um, Sharon and I were actually at a game at Fenway. And I think it was the Brewers. Anyhow, anyhow, the Sox ended up losing 15 to five. And, and, the, and the bullpen was so decimated that I think it was the right fielder ended up, the Sox right, right fielder ended up pitching the last two innings. Anybody remember who that might've been? He should get, he should get the heroism award. Yes. Uh, around what year did you think it was? I think it was the early eighties, but that's, that's kind of a guess. It was a long yeah. time ago. I just heard a call for Jim Rice. Yes. Uh -huh. Good pick. Good pick. It would have, would it have been Dwight Evans? I mean, he played uh, great field in the 80s and he had a good arm. He yeah, might have been, might I, have could been. Have, I, I think I would remember the name if, if it had been Dewey. Yeah. But, uh, but okay. maybe, maybe it was. Maybe it was. It might have been somebody less famous uh, than, say, Dwight Evans. Ted Williams did pitch once uh, an inning or two. That's right. Here's a question. What happened to Jackie Bradley? Oh. He, he just signed a two-year contract with the Milwaukee Brewers for this year and next year. Ah. So Mookie, Ben Attendee, and Bradley, which was a great outfield, are all gone now. Ugh. Okay, any more favorites? Because then we're going to get into the who was the best Red Sox outfielder. Yeah. Okay. One more for the outfielders that I just heard was Jackie Jensen. Ah, oh. yes. One of my first baseball cards was a 1958 Jackie Jensen baseball card. 
I think I still have it. <laughs> what it? Reggie Smith was another one that I wrote down. Oh, very good. Uh, and yet, didn't he break in as a second baseman? Wasn't there something weird about that? Yeah, he was an infielder in 67, I think. Yeah. Um, and then do we, do anybody mention Ken Harrelson? Although he played infield too, I think. No, I was just going to say the Hawk. He came into right field after, uh, what was it, after Tony C got there. Right? Maybe yeah. not really, but in that With game. his neighborhood jackets, if I remember right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, let's, let's move on then. But if you have any more favorites, again, please feel free to interject. Goodman. Hmm. Uh, okay, so the best outfielder, I think, is, is very evident. We're going to show a clip of Ted Williams in a minute. And then if you look at Red Sox outfielders from at least this era, or maybe even all time, Gaz would probably be second. I was going to ask Bill... Once we get through with Williams and Yaz, who do you think in, in this modern day era was probably the Red Sox best outfielder? Well, it really depends, of course, on, uh, I mean, in terms of defense, Jackie Bradley Jr. is the, really the best one I've ever seen. And I think that's one of the reasons that so many of us are sad to see him go, despite the fact that he is not that consistently strong on offense. Uh, Mookie Betts, again, another very, very recent guy. He had it. I mean, he's the kind of guy you'd think you'd build your team around, but for whatever reason, he's now with the Dodgers. And would you rate them ahead of Fred Lynn? Fred Lynn is, I think, you know, you're probably, uh, Fred Lynn's probably the best overall choice, I think. I mean, he came right in and he was rookie of the year, his very first year. The Red Sox won a pennant almost won the World Series. Carlton Fisk hit his famous home run near the end of the 1975 series there. He's another one that left us earlier than I wish he had. Right. And does anybody in the audience have an opinion on maybe who was the third or fourth best side Jimmy, Jimmy Pearsall Sultz just popped up in the chat. Pearsall did? And just Jimmy Pearsall. He was, as I remember, he was a great defensive outfielder. I don't know that he had a lot of power. You're supposed to have had a great arm. Okay. I think he used to get, I remember reading stories like he, Willie Mays and some other guys like during either spring trainings or all-star games or things like that would have basically throwing contests. Like who could throw the ball, like stand at home play, who could throw it out over the left field wall or things like that. And uh, PSL was always one of those guys that just had a cannon for an arm. <laughs> okay, excuse me, we're gonna divert then for just a second because one of my favorite stories from our Talking Baseball program in Central Texas is we, we also do the program at the VA hospital in Kerrville, Texas, which is about 60 miles away from us. And at our very first meeting, we're talking about uh, baseball in general. And then I mentioned Ted Williams and this gentleman that's sitting right in front of me, he's about 90 years old. He raises his head and he says, I've got a story for you. And he proceeds to tell me about going to a game at Fenway Park and a player got mad at the umpire and threw the ball out of the stadium. Mm. And I'm shaking my head like, okay, I'm, uh, this is a great story, but I'm not sure it's true. <laughs> and, and Beth had mentioned that, that Bill is a member of Sabre. Well, so are Mike and I. And Sabre has this great resource where you can post questions and somebody will inevitably respond to you. So we posted, does anybody, has anybody ever heard of a player in a major league game getting mad at an umpire and throwing the ball out of the stadium? And two days later, we get an email that says, check out Jack Kramer, who was a pitcher for the St. Louis Browns, who got mad at an umpire at a game at Fenway Park and threw the ball out of Fenway Park. As Google is our friend, we checked it out on the internet and found stories that in a game in 1946, 
Jack Kramer pitching for the Browns, covered to play at first base. The umpire called the runner safe. Kramer gets kicked out of the game and throws the ball out of Fenway Park. So talk about strong arms. There's one for you. Uh, any other stories about Red Sox outfielders? And then we're going to show a, a clip of Ted Williams' last last game. Well, it lasted bad anyway. I, I just wanted to mention Jim Rice. It's no, I don't think his mm -hmm. name came up. I mean, he certainly wasn't great defensively, although I think he was better than he gets credit for. But he, for six, eight, maybe even closer to 10 years, he was as fierce a hitter as there was in baseball. And, and, he, and he had that, that sort of, uh, I don't know what you call it, the generational thing where it went from Ted to Yaz to Rice as left fielders. They had whatever that would be, 50 years in a row of Hall of Fame left fielders there. Yep. Wow. Okay, well, let's see if this strikes any memories for anybody. This is Ted Williams, his last game at Fenway Park. September 28, 1960, the last day at Fenway Park. Wednesday afternoon, otherwise meaningless game. And Jack Fisher was the pitcher for the Baltimore Orioles. That day, going to the ballpark, it was cold, dreary. It was, it was a terrible, it was not a good day for baseball. Ted walks in one of his at-bats and he gets two very long fly balls, but the ball wasn't carrying well that day. They were caught out there by the fence, and I hit them both good. It was a dull, damp day in Boston. The wind was really blowing in from right field, so I really didn't think that against that wind, he had a chance to hit it out. It's the eighth inning, and he knew this was his last time at the plate. People realized they were suddenly seeing Ted Williams for the last time as a player. It was not that big a crowd that day, only about 10,000, but they were all standing and you knew what they wanted. And can you deliver in that situation? How hard is that to do? The first pitch was a ball. The second pitch was a fastball and it was pretty much right down the middle of the plate and he swung and missed it. I missed it and I to this day don't know how I missed that ball. And he said, I can see it going through his mind. The old man can't get around on the fastball. So sure as I'm standing here, I know that fastball's coming again. I knew I was going to get another one because he couldn't wait to say, well, I'll throw this one by him. Fisher throws the ball. And if there was ever going to be a time when he would go back on his pledge of not wanting to tip his cap, that would have been it. And he said later that as he rounded second, the thought crossed his mind. I thought about it. I thought about it. But uh, just something I couldn't quite do. He just kept the head down and kept churning and went right into the dugout. Of course, people are still cheering and asking for a curtain call and this, that, and the other. And so I kind of fumbled around on the mound, went back, grabbed the rosin bag, took my time giving him a chance. And the umpires and his teammates and the manager, Mike Higgins, waving him out. Ted, come out. I look in the dugout there, and he waved to me, go ahead and pitch. I'm not going back out. I'm gone. Goodbye. <laughs> Over. Wow. So I'm, I'm curious if anybody might have been at that game or listened to that game on the radio? You were. But I, I heard it on my transistor radio when I was doing my I, newspaper route. What were you doing, Bill? I was doing my newspaper route, delivering <laughs> afternoon newspapers. There's a, there's a good side story to that, uh, too. Kurt Gowdy was the Red Sox announcer that day, and he called that home run. And he slipped. And I'll tell you what the slip was. The Red Sox had three more games in Yankee Stadium uh, to finish the season. But Ted Williams had already decided that he was not going to go to those last three meaningless games. He was finishing up at Fenway Park. But nobody knew that. And, of course, the Yankees were selling tickets uh, to people who expected to see Ted Williams play. Kirk Gowdy blurted out on the radio, Ted Williams has homered in his last time at bat in the major leagues. Oh. 
And he slipped and, and gave it away that Williams was not going to New York for those final three games. That's great. Thank you for that. That's a great story, Ed. And by the way, um, so Ed, you've been part of our JFNCS Memory Cafe community for a long time, and people may not know your baseball connections, but you told me about this. Um, so tell me again how long you've been an umpire. Well, I'm not an umpire anymore. I, I, I umpired for 50 years. I, mm. I started in 1953, and I umpired uh, through 2002. And I did uh, Little League games, Babe Ruth League games, CYO games, junior high games, high school games, college games. Um, I was a member of the Umpires Association. I did semi-pro games. I averaged probably 100 games a year for, five, for 50 years. So that's to a total of 5,000 uh, games. And I also uh, uh, taught umpire schools and still do. I started in 1965 and I teach umpire schools around the area. And my first class this year is this coming Monday, as a matter of fact. Oh. Uh, so I've been involved for a long time. And should I tell that little story now, Beth? Um, I think Jim's got a different spot for that. No, I mean, that's fine. Go for it, Ed. Oh, okay. All right, go All for right. it. What, what happened to me in 1992, um, I was in my office where I work, uh, worked, I'm retired now. And uh, the phone rang, and the secretary came in and told me that uh, the uh, man on the phone identified himself as Haywood Sullivan, the owner of the Boston Red Sox. Yeah. And I, I laughed, and I said, no, that's ridiculous. Somebody's playing a trick on me. She said, well, it sounded real. She said uh, uh, the secretary came on first, and then he came on. And it sounds real. I said, all right. I picked up the phone and I said, good morning, Ed King. And the male voice on the other end said, Mr. King, this is Haywood Sullivan, uh, the owner of the Boston Red Sox. And uh, we are going to have an old timers game uh, near Father's Day. And we're going to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the 1967 pennant winning Red Sox team. Remember this was 1992 so it had been 25 years. He said we've invited all kinds of older players back uh, both from the Red Sox and from their opponents and we're going to play the game and we'd like you to be one of the umpires. And I said oh my goodness gracious me of course I'd be happy to do that. And uh, they said and, and afterward we're going to serve dinner in what was then called the 700 Club. It is now called the 406 Club, which is upstairs in Fenway Park. And they said, and you're welcome to bring a guest with you and join uh, you for that dinner. And I said, that's fine. So I went and uh, I asked my wife if she wanted to go with me, and she said, oh, my God, no. She said, take our oldest son. He would enjoy it much more. He was 29 years old at the time. And he came with me to the game, and we went into the dressing rooms and into the dugout and so on and so forth and went out on the field and umpired the game. After the game was over, uh, we went up into that, uh, what was then called the 700 Club, and we was just seat yourself wherever it became uh, easy to sit. And my son and I ended up sitting at a table with Ted Williams and his son, John Henry Williams. And my son t talks about it to this day, sitting there listening to Ted Williams talk about baseball and talk about old-time players and so on and so forth. It was the thrill of a lifetime. But the funny story, uh, i got to tell this one quick thing. The first play of the game, the batter hit a ground ball to the Red Sox shortstop, which was Rico Petroselli. He scooped it up and he threw to first, and George, I was the first base umpire. George Scott was playing first base. He had been on that 67. He fielded the ball, and the, the throw pulled him off the base, and he whirled and made a slap tag at the runner and just barely nicked him on the hip just before his foot hit the base. And, of course, I gave a big dramatic out sign, and then 
as the batter runner was walking back toward the dugout, I realized I had just called out Kurt Flood, a Hall of Fame player for the St. Louis Cardinals. <laughs> and I said, oh, my God, look at me. And, uh, and, and that was it. Uh, I could go on for an hour uh, telling stories about that day and that game. But the, but the big thing was sitting at a table with Ted Williams and his son, John Henry, and uh, and just listening to uh, talk about baseball from the great the greatest hitter that ever lived. Yep, I, that's, that's great, great Ed. Ed. Thank you. And Ed, I know you're on the phone, so you can't see us, but you've got a lot of that's people great. smiling and hanging on your every word here. Oh, I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad. That I'm glad. It's amazing. Okay, Ed. So a little off topic, but if you've so you've umpired for over fifty years. Yes. A grandparent that's still going to his grandkids' baseball games. What, what's your have parents become more belligerent since 50 years ago than they are now, or have parents always been this way? It's always been it's always been that way. Um, I think one of the problems, and this is going to sound kind of sour grapes, but but I really mean it, is that. A lot of the young umpires that, that do these amateur games are not well trained, and they do make a lot of mistakes. and um, And the parents do get upset, and I and I understand that. Uh, one of the things that I really enjoy doing is teaching the umpire schools. Uh, o- over the years, since I started the schools in 1965, and um, I'm tough. I mean, I really am. I get these young men and an occasional young woman. Uh, and I insist that they pay attention uh, during the uh, classroom and learn the rules. And then when I take them out onto the field and show them the proper positions to get into, uh, I test them in all that stuff and I mark them. And uh, I wish there were more of that. Yeah. Well, again, I want to push Bill's book. It's thoroughly enjoyable if you have any interest in the perspective. Yeah, I, I, I wrote it down when you mentioned it before. Absolutely. Yeah. Great book. Uh, so let's go back to the Ted Williams because there's the rest of the story. So he bats in the bottom of the eighth and then this is before the DH. So did he go out to left field? He did. And after he got there and warmed up, Before the inning started, uh, the manager sent a young man named Gene Stevens out to replace him, and he trotted all the way in from left field, and the place went absolutely berserk, uh, standing ovation from the crowd that was there. There wasn't much of a crowd, but the ones that were there gave him a standing ovation all the way into the dugout, and he never tipped his hat or acknowledged the cheers. He just went into the dugout, and that was the end of that. Yeah. Wow. He did okay. tip his hat later on. Um, when uh, when he came back, uh, it might have been that uh, – no, I, I'm not sure when it was, but they had a, a big uh, – I think it was the All-Star game. Yeah. And, uh, and he made an appearance at the All-Star game in his wheelchair, and uh, – I was there that day, and and he actually took his hat off, tipped his hat, and he said, he said the press always made a big thing that I would never tip my hat. Today, I tip my hat to all of the wonderful fans of New England. And he took off his hat in his wheelchair and waved it to the crowd. Great. Thank you so much, Ed. I tell you, if we do this again and I can't get Bill and Mike, I'm going to get Beth to give me your phone number so you can be my subject. I, I'd be happy to do it, but you better hurry up because I'm going to be 81 years old in May. <laughs> uh, you've got plenty of time. But okay. thank you so much. That's great. Okay. And, and I just want thank to um, I just want to pause for a moment and just say hello to some of the folks that joined us more recently. Um, hi, Judy. Hi, Alyssa. Alyssa, I see you have a little one there with you, which is wonderful. Great to see you. And Renee and Jackie and Jillian, um, Zachary, Cindy. I hope I didn't miss anybody, but we're glad to have each and every one of you. And we're talking baseball. And so I'm going to turn it back to our guests to keep going. 
Okay. Well, let's let's go to catchers then. Red Sox catchers. And again, we want to talk about your favorite, not necessarily the best. So if you have an, uh, an opinion, please speak up. So again, these are catchers from the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And I'm going to venture a guess that almost everybody is going to say Carlton Fisk. But let's open it up and see if anybody has any other favorites that are on the screen. I'm going to throw out Bertie Tebbets. Bertie Tebbets. Good one. Who managed what? Cincinnati later when he after he retired as a player? I think so. Bill, Mike, didn't Bertie Tebbets manage? I, don't I think know that's that right. He did. did he? Yeah. And didn't look looking at those four guys, didn't Sammy White also have like the Sammy White Bolodrome somewhere down the street uh, <laughs> outside of Boston slightly? Does anybody remember that? A bowling alley? I, I, I never think he went had a bowling, bowling there, but uh, there was a there was an incident there where a few people were killed in some kind of mob violence. Ooh. Oh wow. But but he did have a bowling alley, right? Yes. I, I remember yeah. that. I think name. it was yeah. in Brighton, Massachusetts. Yeah. Anybody have a Brighton connection? Yeah. Emmy White. Yeah, Malcolm grew up in Brighton. There you wow. go. Just a little. Just on Hill Brighton, yeah. And I see Bob Montgomery. Did he do some color work on the radio for the Red Sox? Yeah. Or am I making that up? No, he did. He was the backup. Okay. I think he might have been, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong, he might have been the last player who didn't have to wear a batting helmet because he was sort of grandfathered in, and he was the last guy to retire. I think he might have won an insert, but he was the last uh, player that never wore a batting helmet in the major leagues. Wow. And I also you. just saw, sorry, uh, and again, I, I hope I'm getting all these names right. Uh, that Polly typed in uh, Jason Veritek for favorite catcher. Ah, yes, well, of uh, yeah, favorite catcher. Yep, yeah, I agree with that. Good choice. And I know he's a former Yankee, but I think Elston Howard had a stint with the Red Sox, and he was a mm -hmm. great catcher. He definitely did in '67. Ah, uh, '67. Yeah. Jason Veritek is, of course, known for helping the Red Sox win the World Series, which some of us may remember. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, he he's ever also, he's also working as a coach with the team right now. He's he's in spring training this year, working as a coach. Oh, good. Do you, do you think he'll ever be a manager for the Red Sox? I think he's got what it takes. Uh, so it's just a matter of maybe putting in some time and uh, waiting for an opening. Yeah. Cool. And Alan suggests Mo Berg. Oh, wow. Going back, yes. The spy, right? Yeah, I I, uh, I went to Japan once to, well, actually, the most recent time was 2008, where the Red Sox had the uh, opening game was in Japan against Oakland. And so uh, they played a couple of games in Tokyo, and I took advantage of the occasion to visit the tower from which Moberg had taken some photographs oh, cool. of the Tokyo skyline that he then turned over to the OSS, the uh, predecessor of the CIA, to help the, uh, the people that were going to bomb Japan during World War II. Yeah, the Doolittle raid, I think. Right? Jimmy Doolittle? Is that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, fun. Good one, Moberg. I love that. Going back to my old baseball cards, I remember Jim Pagliaroni from yeah. ah. the and early we a, 60s. We have a call for Rich Gedman. Good one. Yeah. Good one. Like, was he a local guy? Was he from Worcester or somewhere? Worcester. Worcester, Worcester yeah. 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 Angela, I'm curious if, um, so you're joining us from Beijing. Is, is baseball, like, are people into baseball where you are? Is that... Not really. I think um, ping pong and badminton are a lot bigger here. Ping pong and badminton. That's okay. great. I love how it's still a national and local kind of thing, you know, that it varies from place to place. Yeah. yeah. It's so much fun to learn about baseball. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're a good sport. I'm learning too. This is 
like 90% of what I'm hearing is all new to me. So uh -oh. okay. <laughs> I've got the well, hat, but that's about it. <laughs> well, well, and I say, speak, speaking of Chinese baseball really quickly, um, Eric Robinson, and Jim and Bill, I don't know if you remember this from the Sabre group, he did some research. There's a Chinese team, maybe not now, but over the last couple of years, and it, I think it was the Chinese national team um, at whatever level they're at, we're playing with a Texas single A or double A team to get experience. And, and half of the Texas team was made up of, of Chinese ball players. Wow. And I think Eric said he would consider them perhaps single A level, single A, maybe double A level, because it's still a, in a sense, it's a fairly new sport there and they're, you know, getting their feet under them, so to speak. But for some odd reason, they have a connection with a minor league, a low-level minor league Texas team. Wow. And wasn't there a movie a couple of years ago about a major league scout that went over to India and signed, I think, two cricket hurlers? Or I think that was tr a true story. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, let's move on on catchers then. I, I think this is pretty evident. I, All right. I'm just going to... Throw one more name in as you transition, which is Rick Farrell, which I just got received that message. So. <laughs> oh, Rick Farrell, we are going back. Is that the Mel Parnell era? Even before. Very right, carry, good. Carry on, carry on. No, don't carry it. This is why I love this. So we get names back from the, the I think the 40s and maybe the early 50s, but good one. And, and Rick Farrell's brother, I think, play was a pitcher, maybe. Wes yes. Farrell. Wes Farrell, yeah. Yeah. Rick, Rick's in the Hall of Fame, I think. Uh, and Wes isn't, but Wes was probably the better athlete. Oh. Uh, very good. Good suggestion on a name. Thank you for that. So, uh, Carlton Fest, best catcher, at least in this era. I, I don't know if anybody has any other suggestions but i'd i'd sure like to hear them if not let's go to probably carlton fisk and i think everybody's going to remember this film clip and fisk will lead it off has a single and has walked twice and the wind blowing out there it goes a long drive if it stays fair home run we will have a seventh game in this 1975 World Series. A lot of body English for Carl Fisk. Uh, watch him. <laughs> How many steps does he take? One. He waits to see it. Get over. Get over. <laughs> he knew it. There it is. The 1 0 delivery to Fisk. He swings. Long drive. Left field. If it stays there, it's gone. Home run. The Red Sox win. And the series is tied three games apiece. Carlton Fisk hit a one nothing pitch. They're jamming out on the field. His teammates are waiting for him. The ball hit the foul pole. And the Red Sox have sent the... Whoops. Sorry. I jumped the screen too quick on that one. But uh, That's great, Jim. Yeah, so do we have anybody that remembers watching that game? What was 75? Game six? I was there for that one. Oh, yeah. Bill had standing room and we sat in the aisle a bit just I was lined up right perfectly with the third base foul line so I could see the ball the entire way couldn't have been a better seat from that vantage point wow super I think the other thing that I noticed from that clip is when they transitioned to uh Ned Martin and Kirk Gowdy what great announcers you all have had in Boston. Um, and, and I'm, I guess I'm curious, and we'll just throw that out then, if anybody has any favorite announcers over the last 40 or 50 years. Uh, I've just recently been able to get Red Sox games down here in Texas, and I, I thoroughly enjoyed Don Arcillo before he left. Do we have any comments on announcers over the years? Anybody have announcers they've enjoyed? 
You can always just unmute yourself or feel free to put it in the chat if you want. So I see Jerry Remy from Zachary. Remy's great. Yeah. Mike, who did you listen to when you first started following the Sox? Do you remember? I want to say when you someone mentioned Mel Parnell earlier, for some reason I remember Ken Coleman and Mel Parnell. And I don't know what was TV, what was radio, because most of it I was listening. I mean, at that point, you, I was probably getting, you know, one game a week at the most. So on TV. So it mostly would have been radio on the transistor, on transistor radio. Uh, but Ken Coleman, Ned Martin, Mel Parnell. And Polly and, and Arnie Slavic just mentioned, oh, it went away, uh, Eckersley, the act. Charlie, did you want to make a comment? Yeah, I, um, I thought Donard Sillo and, and Jerry Remy were a great team. And a, a couple of nights they got laughing so, so hysterically <laughs> that they had to uh, mute themselves. And, and you just saw a video of them just, just completely out of control cracking each other up and um, that was fun to watch and uh, uh, Kirk Gowdy of course was uh, was, a, was a favorite of mine going way back. He has to be in the Hall of Fame I think. Mm -hmm. I, I just watched an interview that Bill helped moderate uh, for us for the Boston mm -hmm. Sabre group and I'm going to Butcher Joe's last name, Joe Castiglione. Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah, you got it right. I love He's him not, on the ra radio too. I'm listening to him on the radio for sure. Yeah, for 30, 34 or 35 years now. Wow. And did he have any stories? I, I'm drawing a blank right now. I, I enjoyed the interview. Any stories that stuck out to you, Bill? He's got nothing but stories. I, I, nothing comes to mind right, right, <laughs> okay, right now. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm springing that on you. Yeah, Dave O'Brien uh, just got mentioned as well. He's he's very enjoyable to listen to. I think. Super. Okay, well we're going to transition then to 1950s TV, and as Mike knows, I'm a sucker for old TV westerns and uh, TV shows from late 50s, early 60s. So here's just, we're going to do just a couple of really brief clips. Uh, this first one, Mr. Ed from 1963. And nobody's going to remember this and everybody's going to be reminded of how terrible 1960s sitcoms were. But here's a clip of Mr. Ed and the Los Angeles Dodgers. I'll show them who's the brains of this outfit. <laughs> well, Leo, I hope you win those three games in your home stand. Why, we're a cinch, thanks to... <laughs> hey, what's going on out there? What's all this clowning around here, John? You know we got a big game tonight. Ignore my horse. He's just a show off. It was a horse's idea, Leo. We look around, and there he is with a bat in his mouth. It'll make a great publicity I'm shot, I'm going to pause Leo. this real quick. For you Yankee haters, does anybody recognize number 14 for the Los Angeles Dodgers? His nickname was Moose. Bill Scourin. Bill Scourin, who got that? That's great. It wasn't I know me, it was Malcolm. Good job, Beth. <laughs> it wasn't yeah, me, it was good, Malcolm. Yeah. He gets credit for that. <laughs> okay, let's go on. Yeah, not bad, not bad. Say, is it okay if Sandy tosses one to him nice and easy? Yeah. Ed wants to make a fool of himself. It's okay with me. All right. Sandy, nice and easy, huh, buddy? Okay, John. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see that? I don't believe it. No? 
that's the smartest horse I ever saw. Well, he's not so smart. He forgot to touch second base. Okay, pretty bad. But uh, you notice Leo DeRocher. And next, we're going to go to a Monsters TV show. Jim? And Jim? Yeah. I just, uh, Zachary Branco just wrote about how great Sandy Koufax was, seeing him on the mound there. <laughs> Giving up a home run to Mr. Ed? But yeah. <laughs> can I, can I, sorry. Please. Um, if I could just jump in for a minute, I just want to say hello, hello to someone who just joined us, um, Utah in Santa Fe, who actually brought the first memory cafe to the United States. So it's wonderful to have you here today. And I just wanted to say hello and welcome. Yes, welcome. Thank you for joining us. I apologize you joined right in the middle of Mr. Ed because that's a <laughs> pretty weak film clip. But, yeah, uh, that's okay. This isn't the Oscars. We're just here to have fun. Okay, well, I'm glad because now I'm going to show you Herman Munster once again trying out for Leo DeRocher. And DeRocher's in all these. And uh, Walter Alston, the manager of the Dodgers at the time, had more class, I think. Where do you want it? <laughs> Where do I want? Why don't you try and hit Real it over quick. the Useless trivia. So Fred Gwynn, who played Herman Munster in real life, was six foot seven. But when he was Herman Munster, he wore shoes that had four inch heels. So he's towering over the five ten Leo DeRocher in this uh, clip. Son of Bill Fence. Gotcha. <laughs> Okay, so for those that are on a phone, we're, we're going to play a clip of I've Got a Secret, one of the game shows. This one's actually from 1952. And it, if you remember I've Got a Secret, they bring in different celebrities and they will tell the host, Gary Moore, what the secret is. And the panel has to try to get it. The secret that Mantle tells is he's about to become the youngest father in Major League Baseball. But also pay attention to the prize money that they give Mantle for his favorite charity after each panelist cannot guess. On tonight's special guest, ladies and gentlemen, the sensational young center fielder of the New York Yankees, Mr. Mickey Mantle. We are most happy to have you with us. I know that you got three hits and five times at bat today. What is your, your uh, average for the series so far? Well, I don't know where that makes uh, five for nine. It's almost 600 right now, Gary. Wow. Tell me this confidentially. Now, I want you to tell me tales out of school, but um, who do you think is going to win? <laughs> well, I think we'll win it. You think you will, huh? I wonder why you think so. Mickey, we'll have our panel start digging here for your secret in just a moment. But first, of course, in this case, the money will go to Mr. Mantle's favorite charity. Now, Mickey, if you'll uh, whisper your secret to me, please, we will let the folks at home know what it is. <laughs> Base is loaded, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Question with Miss Jane Meadows and Miss Meadows, I will tell you that this is something that is going to happen to young Mr. Mantle. Mr. Mantle, is the baseball mentioned in the secret? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. It is. Um, does it by any chance have anything to do with your batting average? <laughs> I don't think so, no. No? <laughs> well, is this by any chance going to happen in the Yankee Stadium? No. No? No. no. Will the uh, Brooklyn Dodgers have anything to do with it? I hope not. <laughs> Mr. Mantle, when you signed with the Yankees, was this in your contract? Ten dollars down, 
seventy dollars to go, Mr. Melville Cooper. Okay, okay, we're going to move on. But notice they gave him ten dollars and seventy more to go. So the prize money back in nineteen fifty two is a little bit different than it is on today's game shows. Uh, so okay, so now this one's just kind of open it up and see if anybody wants to tell us some of your favorite experiences at Fenway Park, a particular game you went to. Uh, I'm curious if anybody has ever sat in the green monster seats, because that's something that's on my uh, bucket list. Um, so let's, let's just open it up and please, please share with us. So I see Zachary has his hand raised. Go ahead, Zachary, just unmute yourself. So yeah, um, I my favorite Red Sox experience, um, I went to this game in 2007 and it was the Red Sox versus the Yankees and they hit four consecutive home runs. Wow. It was Manny Ramirez, J.D. Drew, Mike Lowell, and then Jason Veritek. Wow. <laughs> Neat, thank you. That's great. Especially against the Yankees. Of Proud course. Of course. Yes. The that's great. What about anybody else? And by, by the way, you can also talk about playing baseball if any of you, you know, as kids or older, played baseball, watched baseball, had any kind of baseball, way that baseball was part of your life at any point. Feel free to share the story. We'd love to hear. I remember going to my brother's little league games and picking dandelions and looking for <laughs> frogs and things like that, trying to stay busy. I remember my youngest son playing little league and picking dandelions out in right field. So there. Actually, my son did that too. I had him in t-ball and he would pick dandelions in the outfield. So that didn't go very far. No, neither did <laughs> Did, has anyone taken a tour of Fenway Park? I've done that a couple of times. And, you know, they've, I don't think they did it 30 or 40 years ago, but they give a really nice tour of the park. If you ever get a chance, it's a lot of fun. Any other stories? Bill, of all the games you've seen at Fenway, uh, I can probably guess which one stands out, but can you share with that with us? Yeah, there's a lot of games that stand out. I've seen a few no hitters and stuff, but the first thing that came to mind was an experience that I had, which I doubt many others have had. Uh, I was working on a book about people that work in and around Fenway Park, ticket takers, ushers, Boston policemen on, du on uh, duty, the organist. Uh, I interviewed everybody I could think of, and one was the night cleaning crew. And I decided to stay all night. I, I went to a night game, I interviewed the crew and then I just said, I'd just like to observe for a while. And I ended up staying till seven o'clock in the morning, just uh -huh. watching the ballpark, seeing, uh, I mean, basically they were cleaning the park pretty much all night, took a 20 minute break around 3 a.m. and then went back to, to work again with the blowers for all the peanut shells and uh, stuff that was there. And uh, it was a, it was an interesting experience going all nighter at Fenway. Nice. Uh, are the okay. lights are the lights on the whole time? They, like, they dim most of the lights because, uh, you know, that the neighborhood. Uh, yeah. And, you know, it's just a waste of electricity. They yeah. enough so they can clean the park. But otherwise, no. That's yeah. so cool. I went about who was the best second baseman in Red Sox history, when um, who's, who's the best? Oh, Williams. Who was the best second baseman to play when Ted Williams was playing? Uh, Maybe Bobby Doerr. Bobby Doerr was that the one? Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, he that was, right, he was in Ted Williams era, and he's in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, hey, Bill, was, was Bobby Doerr with Ted Williams at that flight school in North Carolina that Ann Keene wrote the book about? Do you, does that sound might have been, They weren't in the service at the same, in the same service. Ted Williams was in the oh. Navy and then, and then they became a Marine Corps okay. pilot. Okay. That's right. Yeah, that, that's another great book. Uh, Ann Keene is, is a volunteer here with, 
talking baseball in Austin and is friends with, with Bill. Um, and unfortunately, I'm drawing a blank on the name of her book. Thundercloud Nine, maybe? Yeah, Cloudbuster Nine. Cloudbuster Nine, thank you. Uh, looking at Fenway, and I, I think it's the oldest park in the majors. I'm mm -hmm. curious if anybody in the audience has been to any major league parks that are no longer in existence. Anybody been to Ebbets Field or the Polo Grounds? There must or... have been people that went to Braves Field in Boston, right? Old Where's Sportsman's you? Park in St. Louis. Ah, Good for old you. Old Comiskey in Chicago. That's Great. Alan. Yeah. What about Old Yankee Stadium, Alan? Yeah. There's the new Yankee Stadium now, but that's only about, what, 12 or 13 years old. I went to Ebbets Field. Oh, wow. <gasps> Long time ago. Do you remember the organist that played? <laughs> no. I think she's in the, I think she has, not a statue, but she's in the Baseball Hall of Fame. She's recognized. Was it Gladys Gooding hmm. who would sing the national anthem and play the organ before the game? And, and the Dodgers had the symphony band that would walk around. Uh, apparently, Ebbets Field was just a mess. <laughs> so here's a message from Mary and Randy that Randy saw a perfect game at Yankee Stadium in the early 80s. Ooh, ooh. ooh. Huh. And Did Renee also know? has been to the old Yankee Stadium. Fun. Was, was the, would the perfect game, Bill, you might know this, or, or anybody for that matter, would it have been Wells? Let's do the perfect game for the Yankees in the 80s, 80s or 90s. I don't Cone? remember the details either. I think I, it was Cone or Wells. Was David mm, Could have been. I know Wells did as a Yankee because I, I have a picture of oh. Wells and, and Don Larson and Barra. Oh. And, uh, okay. and that timing's probably about right. Maybe. Yeah, I watched Don Larson's perfect game on TV. Really? It's the, it's the only time I ever rooted for the Yankees to win a game. And that was like, it, not until the eighth inning when it was clear what was going on. <laughs> wow. Boy, you've got the history with this. That's cool. Any other old stadiums? Uh, I, I saw a game at the LA Coliseum, uh, the old County Stadium in Milwaukee. Uh, I too have been to the old Comiskey. Rig I'm hearing a call for Wrigley Field. For Wrigley Field, yes. That, I and think also, that's just... so this is interesting. So Stephen writes, we went to Fenway two weeks ago to get our COVID vaccines. So the fields are being used in a new way now. And he said, we peeked at the field and saw it covered with snow. Wow. Everybody was super nice. It was a great experience. Oh, oh that's great. That's great. <laughs> oh, look at that. You have a ball that says, I get vaccinated at Fenway Park. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, it's a pin. I thought it was actually a baseball. Yeah. It's a pin made to look like a baseball. But and Paul and Arnie, by the way, pointed out um, Pedroia for second baseman. So we have another ah, vote good. for best second uh, baseman. Pedroia's got to be an all-time favorite. Yeah. yeah. Ebbets Field in 1956. <laughs> oh, thanks, Gil. I was, I was a big Dodgers fan. And uh, after they left Brooklyn, I gave up on baseball. But <laughs> I still remember the Dodgers lineup from back then. I was right. a real baseball fan. Does anybody Seriously. remember? Back in the day, we used to play when we were kids this game called All-Star Baseball. <laughs> All-Star Baseball had a, a spinner. Oh, a yeah. Card for every player. Right? And they had numbers from 1 right. to like 30. Okay. Right. And you would spin the, this was the, the precursor to electronic games. games and baseball. Old games. Huh? I don't know if you can see yeah, it. That was fun. That was always fun to play. That was Here's the game I played as a kid with a spinner. <laughs> <laughs> so you saw Campanella play? Oh, Camp, that was the, the big tragedy of my childhood was right. when he was in that car accident. Oh, right. absolutely. Long Island Press, oh. Huh. Okay, so did you, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I cried, that was awful, it was just terrible. Yeah. 
So did you get in arguments as who the best center fielder in New York was at that time? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Snyder, Mays, and Mantle. Snyder, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, my I father was could. a Giants fan, and uh, I was a Dodgers fan, so it was uh, a battle. Uh, it was a Doran, uh, Doris Kearns, good one, wrote a great yep. book about Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Dodgers fan. <laughs> Yeah, Bums is a great book, too. We had a couple people remember visits to Connie Mack Stadium and Municipal Stadium in Kansas City. Oh, okay. Somebody needs to help me. Was Connie Mack Stadium Shy Park or the Baker Bowl before they named it after Connie Mack? I think it was Shy, but somebody else Shy Park. Sure. Okay. Because one of them, when it was like Shy Park, they had a Life Boy soap commercial painted on right field and somebody snuck it said like uh Phillies use life boy and somebody snuck in overnight one time and painted underneath that and said and they still stink mm. so there you go that's my <laughs> yeah. that's my Phillies yeah. trivia so okay Jim, so Beth, go ahead Jim, uh yeah. it looks like Beth Beth you really know your stuff no, it's not me. It's Malcolm is, is sending me the answers. I don't know any of this. I can't take credit. I said that, that there was a Yankee Stadium perfect game in 99, and it was David Cohn. I bet it was Wells then in the 80s. Wells anyway. was 98. Yeah. <laughs> Just repeating what I'm hearing. That's great. How about others? You know, we have a few people joining us today for the first time. And so I'm betting that you are baseball fans and um, anybody who hasn't had a chance to share a story who wants to. Doesn't have to be about the Red Sox. Just Doesn't have just, to be about the Red Sox. Yeah. Anybody remember playing baseball yourself or? Um, having a family member who was into baseball. <clears throat> um, Abby says, um, this is so fun. I wish my son-in-law was here. He is the biggest Cubs fan. He's from South Carolina. Yeah, oh, um, my, my son-in-law um, lives in a tiny, he's, uh, in, he's in his forties, uh, early forties. He's from South Carolina, the smallest little town, nowhere. And apparently the radio station that he listened to was from Chicago. They got, they, I guess, piped in radio stations and he became such a Cubs fan um, because of that radio station. Um, he cried when they won, didn't they win a couple of years ago? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh my God. You would think <laughs> that our household went into shock. He started crying. He said, I wish my father was alive to see this. Oh my God, we are such Cub fans. So he's a- uh, That's great. Yeah, he's not here, but boy, he'd love this. He would love this. Uh, this <laughs> great. Well, I bet there's some similar reactions from Red Sox fans from 2004 when they finally won it. So any other comments, Beth? I think we're about We've used up our hour, right? Yeah, I think we're we're getting ready to wrap up. Um, okay. But Mary Mary points out um, they grew up in Kansas City and moved to Boston in 1978, and George Brett was Randy's hero. So thanks for pointing okay. out George Brett. Yes. I got a question. I got a question for Jim. You okay. put in the chat that you grew up in uh, North Bill Ricker. You don't sound like it. Oh wait, Mike grew up now. <laughs> yeah, I'm, was that Mike? I'm, yeah, I'm from Bill Recca. Uh, I misread that. Sorry. Yeah, yeah no. no, Mike's here to translate my accent. If anybody had any <laughs> trouble following West Texas accent, so yeah, no, uh, no, I, I just get up there because my wife's family lives in uh, Carlisle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jim. Jim married into Red Sox Nation, which is yeah. nice. Yes. So anyway, anyway, thank you, folks. This was so much fun hearing your stories. And uh, I appreciate everybody sharing and hope we can do this again. Thank you so much. So just um, hold on the line for one second, because I want to thank the three of you properly. But I just want to let everybody know that the cafe continues till noon if you'd like to stay with us and we'll move towards our next 
part, which is we're going to have a chat about spring and what spring means to everybody, which can include baseball, but it can include lots of other things too. So I really want to thank Jim and Bill and Mike. This was a treat. Let's all give them a hand and um, really so much appreciation to all of you for this.